do it, but shit. Oh my god. Key terms. Woo. It's like there's more and more and more. By the time we get to chapter seven, there'll be 400 key terms. I'm just kidding, it doesn't get that bad. All right, we'll take a look through some of these, we'll talk about them, and then we'll hit them all as we go through the slides. Turbine engine, what is that? Reciprocating engine, okay, great. Four stroke operating cycle. Guys, I tell you, every, remember when I told you that every engine works the same? It just does. An internal combustion engine, they all work the same. Turbine. Piston, doesn't matter. The way in which it works is a little bit different, but the four stroke cycle is very important. Throttle, mixture, let's start understanding mixture. And for us to understand mixture, I really hope that everybody can understand what I mean and I say the word torch, as in oxyacetylene torch. And if not, we will Google search that. Okay, intake port, carburetor, carburetor ice. I, I think we would expect that here, guess what? We will definitely expect that in Florida and an easy way to make the local news is to not use your carburetor heat and you'll be on channel seven. Okay, uh, carburetor heat, how do we use that? Fuel injection, supercharger, turbocharger, how do I add some more power to this engine. Magneto, I got a surprise for you there. Ignition switch, detonation, pre-ignition, fuel pump system, uh, fuel pressure gauge, vapor lock, could happen. If you have a hard start on an engine, especially a, a fuel injected engine, or especially a continental fuel injected engine, could be vapor lock. Once the engine is running, by the way, it's running. It very rarely, I've almost never, almost never experienced any issues once you get them running. Gravity feed system, fuel tanks, fuel quantity gauge, fuel se selector valve, fuel strainer, dry sump, wet sump, oil systems, oil pressure gauge, oil temperature gauge, cow flaps. Cow flaps are one of those things where we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because you won't fly an airplane with cow flaps unless you fly the Duchess which is a multi-engine airplane, so we'll have time between now and then to figure out cow flaps. Cylinder head temperature gauge, fixed pitch propeller. What does that mean? It means the propeller is one solid piece of metal. 75 inches in diameter, one solid piece of metal, okay? Climb propeller, cruise propeller, yeah, they make different uh, blade angles from the factory depending on which one you're gonna do. Again, not a lot of time there. Constant speed propeller. This is two separate propellers that are connected with a propeller hub and I can control the pitch depending on what kind of performance I want out of the airplane at that time, okay? So difference in fixed pitch and constant speed. What kind do we fly in the training environment? Fixed pitch. But we're gonna get a little bit of idea what's going on in that constant speed propeller in this module. Propeller control. Ha, FADEC. Full authority digital engine control. Set all the pilots that ended up right over there off Pompano Beach. Again, Pompano had nothing to do with the controllers this time, but they crashed and died because of FADEC. Okay, why does everybody get a crash and die? Uh, alternator. I love the alternator and I also love the alternator check. Alternating current, direct current, ammeter, load meter, master switch, standby battery. Woo! All right. Power plants. Reciprocating engine, what does that mean? Usually that means gas burner, okay? Or uh, piston engine, okay? That means something that works on octane, 100 low lead, all right? Aviation gas, av gas, all right? This is a reciprocating engine. This one has a tremendous amount of cylinders. Who knows, you can count them on there, I don't know, 18, 16, 14, however many cylinders it has there. Each one of these is connected to part of that crankshaft and each one goes through the four strokes, just like every other engine, and creates a tremendous amount of power. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm pretty sure I know this, the Antonov 2, that's a radial engine, right? Does anybody know? Yeah, it's a radial. A thousand horsepower, isn't it? Yeah, 
a lot of horsepower, okay? So I can make a whole lot of horsepower out of one of these things. That's cool. Turboprop, King Air, Pilatus, uh, a couple of different airplanes like that. It has a turbine engine, Pratt & Whitney PT-6, whatever it is. A turb this one is a PT-6. A turbine engine that's connected to a propeller through gears, okay? Remember we said here horizontally opposed, I got this this engine, the one that we use in a training program, how is that propeller connected to the engine? It's bolted straight on. So if that engine goes around one cycle, one 360 degrees, that propeller goes around 360 degrees. Here, it's not connected, shoot, that, <laughs> the turbine shaft in this thing spins at 38,100 RPM, okay? the propeller would fling off into somebody's forehead if it was going that fast. So it's not connected to the shaft. Instead, it's connected through gears, okay? All right, in fact, it's kind of neat. With the PT-6, I could go out there and hold that propeller blade with my hand, hold it. And you can crank the engine, and I'm still holding the propeller blade. Kind of a neat deal. Of course, you let go of that thing, it's gonna start moving really, really fast, but it's not connected directly to the engine at all. You can't do that with one of these. You turn the starter, the engine moves, or the propeller moves. And of course, we got turbo jets. A lot of people, the majority of the student pilots these days are going to end up in one of these, okay? All right, as promised, there it is. Let's review just for a second. What is this thing? Please write answer only. Give me a correct answer. What is all this? The crankcase. Thank you. And this? That is the crankshaft. Okay, so as promised, here we go. Now, inside each one of these cylinders, there's a piston. The piston is connected with a connecting rod to the crankshaft. So as the crankshaft moves, you can see now this piston moves back and forth, okay? That's the, that's the entire idea behind what we have going on in this engine. Oh boy, okay. Remember when I told you guys I started flying a long, long time ago? Okay. Well, when I started flying was in the 90s and a lot of the way that people were taught certain things about aviation were, were, were not so discreet, were kind of interesting, but they were great memory aids, okay? All right, so let's figure this out. Here I got the four strokes, the four strokes of an internal combustion engine. So intake, number one, what's happening here? I got an intake valve. You guys see the valve? Let me see if I can get this thing to point. It had a laser pointer on it at one point in time. There we go. You guys see this intake valve right here? This allows air to come in and fill the cylinder. The air is already mixed with fuel, okay? So it's a fuel-air mixture. It comes into the cylinder and that happens as that piston moves down, there's a vacuum created here, which just like it sucks it through a straw, just like you would on a soda or a shake or whatever, it just comes right into that cylinder and fills up the cylinder. The second stage or the second phase here is both valves are closed. The intake and the exhaust valves are closed. The fuel air mixture is in there. The crankshaft is turning, it pushes the connecting rod to the piston, moves the piston up and compresses that fuel air mixture. Makes it very, very volatile, okay? Make just a little bit of spark and now we're gonna have a fire or an explosion, right? Power, compression is nearly complete, you get a spark coming off the spark plugs and that is when the power from the fuel air mixture is released. It releases by making a fire. It makes the fire, rapid expansion occurs, and that pushes the piston down, which you can see what happens here at the crankshaft. And as it completes the cycle, the exhaust valve opens and all of the burnt fuel is exhausted out the exhaust manifold, okay? This is the exact same way that any 
internal combustion engine works. Okay? In order, one through four, you got suck, squeeze, bang, blow. That's exactly how the four cycles work. The same exact thing here. This is just an easy turbine engine, okay? Suck, it comes in through the, through the front, through the intake. Squeeze, it compresses through the compressor veins, okay, and through the compressor section. Bang, there you have combustion. There's plenty of fire here. Rapid expansion, and it releases it right out the back, which of course causes these fans to turn and moving the compressor section going back to blow. So the exact same thing, no matter if it's internal combustion with a reciprocating engine, reciprocating meaning that this thing is turning, that crank is turning, or a turbine engine, okay? All right, now then, different kind of propellers. How does this work? This is the one you guys will fly in the training program. Fixed pitch propeller. I cannot control the pitch of that propeller at all. What I can control is engine output. And I read engine output on the tachometer. Is a tachometer required for me to fly the airplane? Is that required equipment? Oh, of course it is. And I put up here a nice little handy acronym, A Tomato Flames F. These are your required equipment. And flaps for nighttime. So VFR day, VFR night, and we're talking about where to find that on the internet. But anyways, this is required for me to fly. So I control the engine output using the, the throttle. Ah, mixture, oh boy. Yes, air density changes. I cannot control the air density. Now I can control how high I climb, I understand that. But I can't reach outside and change the air density. What I can do is I can change the amount, just like you said, I can change the amount of fuel that goes in and mixes with this air. Okay? Now, a couple of things here about mixture. Why do I want to change that? The answers are getting harder. And I, I tell you what, I know a lot of, uh, you guys aren't gonna even wanna go fly, but it's not the flight instructors at Sky Eagle, it's the flight instructors all over the United States. Flight instructors don't know what the hell they're talking about with this either, they just don't, okay? I didn't in the beginning, I was like, yeah, just do this and do that, and then that's how this works. So I had to think about it and figure this out, okay? Yeah, to get the ideal fuel air mixture, that's what I'm trying to do. But why? What's the idea? Okay, the less oxygen I have, the less fuel I can use. You're right. Either best power, best economy. I'm changing the way at which this airplane, uh, in which the airplane performs. Okay, so if I climb and I'm at full rich mixture, how many gallons per hour am I using at climb power setting? 18 gallons per hour. That is a lot. If I fly my entire flight full rich, even if I'm at 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 feet, if I fly my entire route full rich, I'll run out of fuel way before I was supposed to. All the performance tables in the, in the AFM and the POH show me that this thing should only use about eight gallons per hour. So if I've got it full rich, I'm gonna consume more fuel. Okay, so fuel consumption is definitely part of it. What, what else is going on with this mixture? Okay, I get, I get more carbon deposits, that's correct. The engine will, the engine's dirtier. Okay, a lot dirtier. Power. I have less power. Now we're starting to really get into it. Okay, all right, what, there's one more thing. All right, let's, there's one more. 
Yes, exactly. Cooling and heating the engines. Let's talk through this real quick and, and, and do me a favor because you guys, this is a great class, but please do me a favor. I'm having a hard time gauging on this. If, if anyone is lost during part of this, just tell me because this gets confusing. Okay. Now we climb, we're at altitude. Okay. And probably even along the climb, I might want to lean the mixture, whatever. I get to altitude and now I, I have only a certain amount of air density here. So I may have my throttle still pushed in all the way. 75% power. I'm not making hundred percent power. There's not enough air up there to do that. So I lean the mixture. As I lean the mixture, I'm using less fuel, but I start to get more power. The reason that is, is because the energy is released from the oxygen. The fuel is there only to serve as a catalyst. That's all that is. So we're putting fuel in there to make this oxygen burn, to make it so that that spark plug can burn the oxygen. That's where I came up with the oxyacetylene torch. Have, has anyone here not seen an oxyacetylene torch? A cutting torch, right? People use it to weld or to cut metal. That's an oxygen torch. It uses acetylene so that we have the oxygen to burn. Well, what are they cutting metal with? Heat, okay? And it's a lot of oxygen there. The oxygen is released and that's what causes the heat. That's where all of the power is coming from in this engine. So when we get to altitude or even along the way while you're climbing and you lean the mixture, you will get an increase in performance because now I have a more ideal fuel air mixture. The oxygen is burning completely. Okay. The trade off with this is that it's going to be a hotter engine and that's going to clean the engine better. That'll allow these carbon deposits to go right out the exhaust pipe because they cannot collect to the inside of the engine. They can't collect on the piston or on the valves or on the cylinder head or anything else. It's too hot. It's going to go straight out the exhaust pipe. That's good. I want that. If for whatever reason I take a look and now the engine temperature gauges show that I have a very high temperature, I need to do a couple of things. Okay. I, I, I need to decrease the heat in the engine one way or another. So I could decrease the power enriching the mixture. Okay. That seems a little counterintuitive. Some pilots don't want to do that. But enriching the mixture, that makes a cooler engine. And then also increase the airspeed, decrease the load on the engine. Uh, fixed pitch propeller, like I said, the, the mixture does play a role in this thing. This helps me uh, adjust engine output, but in only that it's either shut off or it's full rich or I bring it back to either my best uh, power or best economy setting. Uh, how can we identify that it is? Uh, okay. All right. Again, we're going to the, uh, with each class, I get to take it a little bit further. I'm getting, I'm gonna take you guys all the way. This is good. All right. So how do I know where it's at? If I have an exhaust gas temperature gauge, do you guys see exhaust gas temperature anywhere on here? Okay. So it's not required, but if I have one and it works, then on that same day, you will find a unicorn. <laughs> okay. But if you have an exhaust gas temperature gauge, you can decrease the mixture. You lean the mixture until the EGT goes all the way to the top and starts coming back because I'm going to get the most heat at best power. But then if I go a little bit further back, there'll be less heat and I'm actually lean of peak. Okay. Now with an exhaust gas temperature gauge, it's usually not, uh, it's usually not recommended that I go lean of peak. This gives me my best economy. This lets me go as far as I could possibly go with any, any given amount of fuel. Okay. But with one exhaust gas temperature gauge, 
I have four cylinders in that airplane and I have two cylinders at the front which are cooler than the two cylinders in the back. So if I only have one exhaust gas temperature gauge, I might have reached maximum temperature, but the front ones are already past maximum temperature and they're already lean of peak. Am I so far okay? So I could damage the engine if I did it with just one exhaust gas temperature gauge and I try to go lean of peak, I try to get maximum economy. Okay. If I have, like for instance, the Cirrus has an exhaust temperature probe on each cylinder and they all work. Now I can lean to the one cylinder that's hottest and then I can go just 35 degrees Celsius below that. Best economy. And the computer helps me do it. It'll tell you exactly where to set it. So if I got a, a digital setup, that's when I can go lean a peak. What we will do usually, because this works, is lean, 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 listen. And you'll hear when the engine starts coming up, not just a little more power, you'll hear it. And now all of a sudden it starts going down. Now I get less power, right? Oh my God, the engine's gonna shut off. No, it's not. Enriching the mixture, just two half turns. Why half turns? Well, look, if I take my fingers like this, that's a half turn. I can't make my hand go all the way around a full turn. So go two half turns, half, half. And that's how we do it, okay? That's exactly how you lean the airplane. When you're in a training airplane or something that doesn't have a good exhaust gas temperature gauge, all right? Okay, if the engine starts overheating, a couple things that I'm gonna do, reduce heat, so pull the power back, increase the mixture, and decrease the load on that engine. So let it go faster. If I'm climbing, stop climbing. And if I'm not climbing, descend, right? Just let there be more air on that engine. Now, <clears throat> airplanes with a constant speed propeller. You won't fly one for a while. You will eventually, but for the time being, it's just an idea. And that is now I control engine output with throttle and propeller control. So I control manifold pressure with the throttle. I might not hear any different noise. I could hear the exact same noise, be very, very slight change, more power, but I don't hear much difference in the noise because the noise is usually coming from the propeller. And the propeller is set using that thing right there. Okay? So I can set whatever RPM I want on the propeller and it goes right there. As long as I'm on the propeller governor, okay? And it's a, just a mechanical device that allows the propeller to stay in an exact RPM. All right. That part, like I said, you don't worry too much about this. You will 100% know about that before you start flying a complex airplane or an airplane with a uh, constant speed propeller. All right, this is your air intake. The air intake is at the bottom of the engine cowl, so below the propeller. The carburetor or fuel injection system, whichever kind of airplane you're flying, is on the bottom of the engine. So a little bit different than cars and trucks or whatever. You got the, the carburetor and the fuel inju induction system on the bottom. There's your air intake. And it has an air filter. The air filter filters out any kind of contaminants, whatever might be out there, bugs, rocks, dust, dirt, sand. There's a lot of sand down there. So this will filter out all of the contaminants and allow clean air to go into the engine. From the air filter, it goes through a duct, right? Through some sort of a tube into the carburetor. We're gonna talk carburetors for a moment because the airplanes that you guys are gonna fly to begin with are carbureted, okay? Again, this sits on the bottom of the engine. So when you see here, you've got engine flow, you got air flow coming through from the bottom. That's because the carburetor is on the bottom. And then from here, it goes up into the engine, okay? 
We don't need to figure out and know exactly everything about a carburetor, how to tune one, how to build one, but it's important for us to take a look at some of these features. Number one, I've got a fuel inlet. This comes directly from the fuel pump. The fuel pump or the fuel tanks. This is just a line that brings fuel into the carburetor. It goes into a float chamber. This float chamber has a float and it will float on top of the fuel. As the engine consumes fuel, it comes right out of here, which causes the level to go down. When the level goes down, that will open up the fuel and allow this float chamber to refill. Essentially, I should always have fuel in this little fuel bowl right here, okay? And we will. Another reason why we can't fly them upside down. Not for very long anyways. And when I do your, your unusual attitude recoveries, get ready because the engine will probably stop working for a little part of that. That's when you close your eyes and you put your head down and I get you in an attitude that's really weird. Eh, the engine will probably shut off for a little while, that's okay. All right, so here I got fuel inside this float bowl and the fuel goes through the mixture needle that goes to that red knob and into the Venturi, into the discharge nozzle. Something that we're going to talk about here in just a little while, probably today, if not 100% tomorrow, is aerodynamics. And this theory uh, that this gentleman named Bernoulli came up with. Has anyone heard of Bernoulli and his principle? Okay, that principle was that if I were to increase the velocity of a fluid, and remember air, behaves very much like a fluid. If I increase the velocity of a fluid, the pressure will decrease. Yeah, so that's fine. It kind of works as the ideal gas law, kind of similar. So look here, I've got a Venturi. I've got an area where the cross section is reduced and that forces the air to increase speed here, okay? When the speed increases, it decreases pressure and then air releases into the flow creates a fuel-air mixture, which is exactly what comes up here and into the combustion chambers. The throttle valve will help control that flow. Remember, where's all this suction coming from right here? From the cylinders. Right, from the intake. That piston is in the cylinder and it just, it comes back, like I said, it comes back just like, a, just like you're sucking a, 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 a milkshake or a, a Coca-Cola through a straw. It's doing that exact same thing. The intake valve is open. You've got a suction coming right here from that piston coming through the cylinder and that's what causes the, the air to uh, accelerate through and release this fuel. And then the fuel air mixture goes through the intake uh, manifold and ultimately through the intake valve and into the combustion chamber. Okay. <sighs> My friends, almost every single year and I'm waiting, it has not happened yet this year, but for like the last seven years in a row, somebody in South Florida lands an airplane off of an airport. They either end up in the beach or in the ocean or in the Everglades or somewhere. Sometimes two or three of them happen in a year, okay? There's only one of two things that happens that will cause that, okay? It's, it's fuel mismanagement, but it's either that they had water in the fuel, which we'll talk about. You gotta collect a sample of the fuel. You, need, you don't need to take off with water in the fuel. It causes a problem or they didn't use the carburetor heat. Flight schools are pretty good down there in, in South Florida, but they're, they're bad at one thing. They're bad at not letting people gain enough experience in the difference between fuel injected and carbureted modeled Cessnas. If you look at one from the outside, it looks almost the exact same. You would not even know. You get on the inside, the, the fuel injected ones have usually a little newer, a little nicer look to it, but you wouldn't know too much except for that this thing has a carburetor heat. 
And I've flown with a lot of student pilots and a lot of pilots that want to rent airplanes and they don't think we're gonna get any icing in Florida. Well, you're 100% wrong. Because in Florida, we're right next to the Caribbean Sea. We have nothing but moisture, very, very moist conditions. And if you climb just a couple hundred feet, you're at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is conditions prime for carburetor icing, which is what happens here. Once that occurs, this could shut the engine off, could cause the engine to no longer function properly and stop working. And once it stops working, it's done. There's, you cannot apply carburetor heat and expect it to work at this point because there's no flow, okay? There is a rapid decrease in temperature right here. And if there's a little bit of moisture in the air, which we have plenty of, it can ice up and cause this engine to stop working. So carburetor heat on before making throttle reductions and then apply power, then take off the carburetor heat. Now, the filter is bypassed when you use carburetor heat. So once I land, part of my after landing checks, and there's only two things that I gotta do, is carburetor heat off, wing flaps up. You can do that without looking at, that's a flow, right? That's a flow uh, procedure. So yes, carburetor heat, takes off the, the filter, but if I'm flying in the air, what kind of debris do I have there? None. There's no debris. I'm an occasional bug or two. I'm not going to get that even. And even if it does, it'll go through the combustion chamber unharmed. Right? It's not going to hurt the combustion chamber anyway. It'll kill the bug. Okay, again, here. High carburetor icing potential. Look at the relative humidity. We haven't talked yet about, uh, I can't wait to talk to you guys about weather. That'll be good. Weather is a fun subject of mine. But relative humidity, 50% to 80%, yeah, I got carburetor heat, uh, carburetor icing is possible. 80 to 100%, which is usually where we are in South Florida, this is high carburetor icing potential. And on the horizontal scale, look at the temperatures here. All the way up to 70 degrees, 21 Celsius. I have high carburetor icing potential, okay? It will definitely happen. So when we apply carburetor heat, what happens? Here you go. Below seven degrees, there's no risk. Well, it's still possible. But below seven degrees. Seven degrees. Oh, below seven? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hang on a second. So below seven, if there is any, any uh, water vapor in the air, it's probably frozen. And that's... Uh, I would, I would say still use it because it's your procedure. Your procedure doesn't change based on temperature, but uh, you might not get any. We don't collect ice on the wings. Uh, below 10 degrees Celsius, you're not gonna get any ice on the wing. Whatever is out there for water is already frozen. Okay, here's how the carburetor heat works. There's the control, it's in the cockpit. When I apply that control, this opens up the valve. There's the carburetor. Here's the air intake, okay? comes over here and would usually go to the engine, but that's shut off completely. Here I have an alternate air source, no filter. It goes through the muffler shroud. Uh, people all over the world don't know what this word shroud is, but uh, you guys know what a mummy is? Right, mummy, it's all wrapped up. That's the shroud. Okay, the stuff that's around it, but it's not, so it's not going through the exhaust. The heat isn't coming from inside the exhaust. It's coming from the outside of the exhaust manifold, but it's heated air. That's the exact same air that we use to heat the cabin. So it's not carbon monoxide. It's just heat that's coming from the, the exhaust manifold and it goes directly to the carburetor. Heated air, that's all it is. It's easy, you lose a little bit of power when you turn it on because now I have less dense air, but hey, that's all right. At least I'm not gonna have a, a stopped engine. Okay, <clears throat> fuel injected. You will not get carburetor icing on a fuel injected system because there's no carburetor, <laughs> okay? So you got a fuel tank, electric pump, engine driven fuel pump, a fuel control unit or an FCU, and it goes up to a fuel manifold valve and a discharge nozzle, okay? 
So this just takes fuel and squirts it into each one of those uh, intake runners. No reason at all. There's no uh, possibility for an icing event to occur on the induction on this. Turbochargers or superchargers. Another nice to know. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. This particular uh, model or slide shows me a turbocharger where normal suck, squeeze, bang, blow comes out the exhaust. As it goes through the exhaust, it spins a turbine and then it goes out the exhaust pipe. That turbine is connected by a shaft to the intake manifold, which now increases pressure and forces more air okay, into the cylinders. So I can get the same power that I get at sea level at 20,000 feet, which is very nice because now I get that same amount of power, but a whole lot less drag because of the air density. Okay. So turbocharger is pretty good, but again, you're not going to fly one in the, uh, in the training program. Okay. Magnetos or ignition systems. Each airplane has two separate ignition systems. The primary purpose for us having two is to create more power. It also conveniently serves as a redundant system. So I've got one there in case one complete system fails. I already have another one that's working. Okay. And they don't rely on external power at all. They generate their own electricity internally, separate from the battery, separate from the electrical system. These things operate all on their own. Okay. Again, though, what's the primary purpose of having two systems, more power. That is the primary purpose. Okay. All right. Magnetos. They create their own power, right? What the world? Are you guys familiar with this guy? Who is that? Magneto. That's Magneto. So I say Magneto and then all of a sudden I got everybody there with Magneto. Well, this guy creates his own power. So do the Magnetos. Okay. They don't require an external source. I don't need a battery. Once I get that engine running, it's going to continue to run and run and run as long as I have fuel and as long as nothing breaks. Okay. This is a magneto switch. This is what I use. Right magneto, left, both, and start. Of course, once I get the engine started, well, I release it. It's spring loaded to go back to the both position. Okay. <coughs> Detonation. Detonation can occur for a couple of different reasons. Overheating, improper fuel, or improper mixture. If the manufacturer says that that airplane requires 100 low lead, I cannot use 87 octane or a lower octane rated fuel. I have to use the fuel that's rated for the air. That makes sense. If for whatever kind of reason I'm in South America and I can't find 100 low lead and I use this, not a wise choice. And the reason being it could cause detonation. Which now, remember earlier we said during that four stroke cycle process, I got a power uh, cycle and that allows for the smooth burning of fuel. Detonation is an explosion. It's more of an instant release of the energy. And that could cause hot spots and cause pre-ignition. If this thing was moving in this direction, let's say that this crankshaft is moving here. I can see that because it looks like the piston is moving in this direction. And then I'm supposed to have a spark and then power driving this thing back down. If this causes pre-ignition, which way is the crankshaft going? Counterclockwise. Now pre-ignition, I've got a tremendous load on that connecting rod. It could break either this, this or that, <coughs> whichever one of those three components is the weakest link. Okay. If I expect detonation or pre-ignition, a couple of things, mixture goes rich, decrease power setting, decrease the load on the engine, right? Stop climbing, 
descend. A couple of things that you could do there. All right. <clears throat> fuel systems. With a low wing airplane, I got to get the fuel from the wings to the carburetor or to the fuel system. So typically speaking, you'll have some sort of a pump, an electric pump and an engine driven pump. That goes through a strainer, which strainer is just a fancy word for fuel filter, and you'll hear them called gascolator. I don't know who came up with gascolator, but you'll hear it called, referred to as a gascolator, and that is just a fuel filter. On the low wing airplane, I got a constant, so on a Cirrus, for instance, I have to change from left tank to right tank, to left tank to right tank, okay? So I'll start off, I'll Whichever takes fullest, I'll start off on that. I'll use that one for half an hour. Then I'll change to the other one and fly that for an hour. And I'm always one half hour out of balance. That's it. Okay. On a high wing airplane or a gravity fed system, I can go to both. So we just put it right there to both and it comes out of both tanks. Uh, some of them have a reservoir tank. Ours does not. There's no reservoir tank on the Cessna. Some of them will have an electric pump, a strainer, and an engine driven pump and a fuel control unit. Ours goes straight gravity fed to the line which goes into the carburetor. That's it. Simple, simple, simple fuel system. Okay? You got a primer over there that you can prime. We'll talk about primers here in a second. On this, and both of them have the same, you've got a fuel vent. The fuel vent is important because as I consume fuel, remember this tank is waterproof. So there's a little bit of, uh, uh, it's kind of sealed. It's a sealed system. If there was no vent as we used fuel, it would create a vacuum up here and then cause the fuel to, to no longer run into the fuel injectors or into the carburetor. So this vent just allows fresh air to replace the fuel as it's consumed. Just as it does on the car. Yeah. Same thing, yeah. Uh, on a car, a lot of times they'll have a return line because they'll have an electric pump and these will have a return line too. This one doesn't have a fuel pump at all. It just goes into the engine, but that vent, that vent allows air to come up and replace the tank or replace the fuel. Uh, well, this one shows both. I, I have not in my lifetime of flying low wing airplanes ever saw one that had a both selection. Why? I, honestly, something to do with certification. I remember there was a gentleman at our school for Cirrus that came and uh, was asking, was answering questions. He was from the manufacturer. And one of our students asked him that same question. Why can't we have a both switch or something that would do it automatically? And it was something about certification that it required it to be you know, one or the other. I, I'm not sure why this one came out of the Jepson. Maybe somewhere there is one, I don't know. But I've never in my life seen a low wing airplane with a both selection on the fuel selector valve. Multi-engines, because the right tank runs the right engine and the left tank runs the left engine. So you have a cross feed, but yeah. yeah. All right, so those are the different fuel systems. Left tank, right tank, selector valve, strainer, carburetor. Like I mentioned, the one that we have, no fuel pump at all. This is for a fuel injected system, and that's the one that we have. Just put it to both and go there. Now you see this little thing here, this tube that goes back and forth? There's such a thing called flying an airplane coordinated. Uh, it's, it escapes most student pilots, uh, most pilots until they get a lot of experience. But you have to apply the rudder pressure to keep the airplane flying straight, especially during a climb or during a descent because propellers fly uh, with one side a little bit more thrust than the other. If I don't fly the airplane straight, I'll see that one tank is probably empty and the other tank is probably full. And that happens just because we're not maintaining coordination. Okay. We'll talk about it during aerodynamics with uh, adverse yaw and a lot of fun stuff there. Primer, as promised, here it is. 
The primer will move fuel from the line directly into the first, third, and fourth cylinders. I don't know why they skip the second. I have no idea, they just do. But it will put fuel straight into those three cylinders. And this allows me to start the engine with fuel already in the cylinders, okay? So that it fires almost instantly instead of cranking and making fuel come through the uh, normal process, sucking it through the intake valves and into the combustion. Less wear and tear on the starter, okay? But that's the primer and it's on the lower left-hand corner of the, uh, of the panel. All right, you guys ready for a little bit of true story? Probably. Okay, true story is, uh, you may have heard this said before, and that is, there's only two rules inside the airplane, okay? And that is rule number one, the commander, pilot in command, the commander is always right. Rule number two is if you question rule number one, then refer to rule number one, right? The commander is always right. Does that make sense? Okay, here, I'm gonna help you guys out with something then. Some flight instructors, some pilot examiners are gonna have a different methodology. They say that, well, the, the primer, you don't do the primer this way, or you do that this way, or you do that this way. It's not uncommon. I, me, personally, I try my best to make sure that the instructors that I work with, they all teach the same. Well, that's fine. What kind of instructors do I have? Humans, okay? And people are gonna do a little something every now and then a little different. Now, I'll tell you what's even worse. What's even worse is, we have what's called designated pilot examiners, and these people, these guys in particular, will show up, and they're the ones that are gonna certify you. So while that person is in the seat, who's right? He is, always. It doesn't matter what I say. Honestly, it doesn't matter what the AFM says. It doesn't matter at that point what anybody in the world says. If you wanna pass your test, which probably you do, that examiner is right, okay? Well, some examiners are gonna say some things like, you shouldn't use that primer, okay? Here's why they probably say that. Do you guys see this? It's, it's, it's tough to see, but do you see this little, you see how this is all silver right here? You see that? It's a collar, right? Just like a collar, it's a collar right here. And that's all silver right there. Do you see this little notch? Can you guys see that? Okay, so the way this thing works is I, I twist this. It's very small, by the way. The picture's humongous, I know. But look, there's the master switch. And you guys know the master switch is only this big. So I twist this primer until the, until the, the cylinder comes out like so. And that cylinder has a little dimple on it, okay? And I push this in and it puts fuel directly into the first, third, and fourth cylinders, okay? Once I push it in, that dimple goes through this collar and then I twist it and make sure that it's locked so this can't come out. You guys, you guys follow me how this thing works a little bit? If this comes open, if this comes out while you're flying, you wouldn't notice it. It would come out because the vibration and everything else. And if it did, it could cause the engine to run very rich and, and shut off, flood the engine. And that could happen while you're doing a touch and go, while you're doing a go around or a rejected takeoff or a rejected landing, okay? So that could happen to this person 
while they were flying the airplane and the, the primer came out and all of a sudden the engine shut off and they really didn't want the engine to shut off. So sometimes people will say, and it's not uncommon, that oh, well, you can't use that primer because I don't want you to. They probably had somebody do something you know, kind of stupid in the past. But this is what it says in your AFM. So in the book, in the book, buy that airplane. It said pumping the throttle may cause raw fuel to accumulate in the air in, in the intake air duct, creating a fire hazard in the event of a backfire. If this occurs, maintain cranking action to suck flames into the engine. An outside attendant, which, okay, uh, with a fire extinguisher is advised for cold starts without preheat. So some of these examiners are going to tell you that you prime the engine by pumping the throttle like this and then you start the engine. I can tell you that it's less likely that you'll get a fire. I've seen pilots do this before and I've not seen too many fires, but you could. Okay, Not supposed to do that. Welcome to the fun part about trying to learn how to fly airplanes. Well, that flight instructor told me this. Well, that flight instructor. Uh, I always say, look at the AFM. The AFM usually tells you the right story. Okay. Now, before takeoff, if I if I have a cold weather situation and I start the engine, how do I know that the engine is warm enough to take off? I might not even have an indication on the the uh, uh, oil temperature gauge. When I can advance the throttle forward and the engine accelerates smoothly then it's sufficiently warm, okay? Right here, if the engine accelerates smoothly, the airplane is ready for takeoff. That's your warm up. I don't need to wait for any kind of indication on a gauge. Now, in South Florida, even in January, February, March, we still have plenty of heat. But if I fly to a cold area, as soon as the engine accelerates smoothly, I'm ready to take off, okay? Now, since the engine is closely cowled for efficient in-flight engine cooling, because they are air-cooled engines, precautions should be taken to avoid overheating during prolonged engine operation on the ground. Long periods of idling may cause fouled spark plugs. Okay, so you get out there, you do your magneto check. Sometimes you'll have a bad check and there's a process to clean that thing out. Because we're taxiing a mile and a half to get to the end of this runway. And it's usually very hot out there too. All right, as promised, I always show you that little fuel vent. There it is. This is on the left wing. So if I were to take a look at, man, my model is getting beat up here. I think I crashed the landing gear. Who knows? Anyways, it's on this left wing. So I, I do my pre-flight. This is the door that I will get in as a pilot or as a student. I'll get in through this door. That fuel vent is on that left wing and it's just behind the strut. Not uncommon for fuel to leak out of this. And that's okay. It's not a fuel leak. It's just fuel coming out of the vent. If it's topped off and it's very hot outside and the sun's shining down on the wings, I might get a few drops of fuel out of it. There is a common fuel quantity indicator. Do I need to have this work before I fly? Does this have to work? It does. Now. <laughs> What does the rule book say? Yeah. The rule book says it has to indicate accurately when it's empty. Okay. So if I go out here and I turn on my master switch and both of these show empty, but I go to the top of the wing and I look, I got 50 gallons worth of fuel in there. Guess what? Well, it reads accurately because when the fuel tanks are empty, it's going to read empty. Yeah. So yes, that is required. Here's a fuel selector valve as shown in most Cessna 172s. Left, right. Uh, something else that's really interesting, and I'll 100% ask you that question if you're flying with us, is uh, how much fuel is in the airplane? Because before you start the engine each and every time, you have to check that the fuel selector valves are on both. Fuel selector valve is on both. Okay, that's fine. So I know you've touched this thing at least a dozen times before you and I fly, 
and I'm going to ask you, how much fuel is in the airplane? I don't know, 100, 200 gallons, I don't know. <laughs> it shows you right there exactly how much is in This one has 53 gallons total. The ones we have will either have 40 or 50. You'll see it, it's right there. This one is common for low wing airplanes. You see you got left, right, or off. Those are your only selections. There is no both. That device is a lockout. So this will lift up and allow me to choose the off position. If that is not pulled up, then the only thing I can choose is left or right. It won't go down to off. I need to deliberately pull that up and go. So that's a lockout. Okay. 100 low lead or avgas is blue. And it's not easy to see the blue unless I hold it up against a white background. So hold it up against the, the nose cone or hold it, hold it up against the white paint on the airplane. The white background so you can clearly see the blue color of the fuel. Also, if I have any water in there, it'll sink to the bottom because the specific gravity of water is heavier than it is for fuel. Okay. Prior to fueling, who's responsible for fueling the airplane, by the way? Who's responsible? Thank you. Pilot in command. Just get used to hearing the word responsible and automatically saying pilot in command. Because believe me, it is you. Okay. So what type of fuel gets in the airplane and the quantity of fuel that gets in the airplane and how the fuel gets in the airplane, that's a you job. Okay. Banyan will do it for you. Yes. Yes. The FBO. The FBO will come out and you probably will never even see them. But it's still pilot and command responsibility. So I got to ground the airplane to the fuel truck or to the fuel delivery system if it's a, a standalone before we can fuel. And that will help prevent any sparks and then uh, the associated fire with that. Avgas 100 low lead is blue. 82 UL is some other kind of crazy color and jet fuel is more of a straw color. Depending on what you got for jet fuel, it's either clear or a straw type color. You could definitely 100% tell the difference between av gas and jet fuel. And that'll tell you right on the airplane with a placard what type of fuel you can put in it and the quantity for that tank. Okay, here is your oil system. Cylinders, pistons on the inside, crankcase, crankshaft. The shaft is connected directly, so direct drive to the propeller hub. Oil filler cap and dipstick. I got a slide next one here to show you too. And an oil temperature gauge and oil pressure gauge, both are required, okay? If you don't get oil pressure, the very first thing you do after you start the engine is look for oil pressure. And if you don't get oil pressure within 30 seconds, it's a rejected start. So kill the engine, stop. If that's not, you check this within 30 seconds. It's not working, that flight is over with right there, okay? And here we got an oil sump, low pressure screen, an oil pump, high pressure screen, an oil cooler and filler, and all of the oil flow going through the crankcase. Just providing oil to the bearings on that crankshaft. Okay, because each one of those, each, uh, in between each one of the connecting rods, the rods that go out to the pistons, there is a bearing or a circular uh, device which allows oil to separate those two metal pieces between the bearing and the crankshaft itself. The purpose of this oil is to lubricate the engine and that is what causes, that's what cools the uh, crankshaft in the crankcase. Cylinder heads are air cooled. This part is primarily cooled by the oil. All right. There is an oil capacity, a certain amount of oil I have, 
on the November model airplanes is anywhere between five and seven quarts. No lower than five, definitely no higher than seven. Typically when you get to six, that's when you, yeah, you're good. Anything over six and it just goes right out the bottom of the airplane, okay? The oil filler dipstick and tube and all that, so here's where the oil dipstick goes. Now, <clears throat> how tight does this need to be? <laughs> Just barely, just a little bit. It doesn't need to be very tight at all. This is not a pressurized system. So just put it on there enough so it doesn't come off during flight. And it's not gonna come off and it's not gonna back out. But just put it on there tight enough just so it stays in. Some pilots, some students will put it on so tight that the next person can't even get it off. So yeah, just finger tight, that's all you gotta do. Oil temperature and pressure. You can see the temperature is up there quite a ways. It's fine. That's normal. Especially if you're climbing, you just can't go over the red line. This is the air inlet and the air intake and how air is used to cool the cylinder heads. You see it comes in through there and over each one of the cylinders. These front cylinders will definitely get cooler than the back cylinders. If you did have a towel flap, then I could control some of the heat inside the, the uh, engine. Okay? So on a climb, for instance, I would open the cowl flaps. And then while cruising or descending, I could close the cowl flaps and keep more heat in there. Okay? The airplanes you'll fly during training, I uh, can nearly guarantee you, if you come to our school, yeah, you're not gonna have cow flaps for the training. But usually training airplanes do not have cow flaps. What's a cow flap? That's a cow flap. Cowl, right? <laughs> Moo, cow, <laughs> not a cow, cow flap. Cowl flap, C-O-W-L. This allows me to manage the uh, heat the engine heat. Sometimes I want to get rid of all the heat. If I'm climbing in a slow airspeed, I want to get rid of all the heat. Sometimes I want to maintain, maintain heat in the system. So I'm descending or maybe I'm flying a multi-engine airplane and I got one engine running and the other engine is not running. Then I close the cow flap, keep that other engine from uh, decreasing heat so fast. Because Metal does not do very well with uh, rapid increase or rapid decrease in temperature. So this helps me manage that. Some airplanes will have a cylinder head temperature gauge. Is a cylinder head temperature gauge required over here? I got, well, I got a temperature gauge, which is liquid temperature or oil temperature, but I don't have anything for cylinder head temperature, right? I don't need this. None of our airplanes have them. You'll find that most constant speed propeller engines have them because they also have cowl flaps and this will help me manage the cylinder head temperature. Okay. All right, environmental systems, all power plant. This whole thing is power plant. Here's your muffler and shroud. I promised you the shroud. There it is. Okay. The air inlet, that's not the air intake. That's not a, the air filter for the air intake. That's down here and it goes to the engine. This is for the cabin. So I got air that comes in through the cowling and enters a duct, enters a tubing, goes through the shroud. Again, it doesn't go through the uh, muffler. That would cause us to die. We'd have uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. But it goes around the muffler it absorbs heat from the muffler, right? Because the exhaust is releasing heat and that heated air then goes through the cabin heat control, the rear cabin, the cabin heat, the defroster. This is what'll help me stay warm in the airplane. We're saying stay warm and we're in Florida. I get it, but we're in Florida and the temperature could be 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Ooh, so cold. All right, climb to 7,000 feet starts getting a little bit colder because you're going to lose approximately two degrees Celsius per thousand feet. 
So climbing, even though it's not that cold on the ground, not that cold, it still gets pretty chilly up there. Okay. Part of the power plant is your propeller. Now, what kind of propeller do I have here? Is this fixed pitch or is this constant speed? And how do I know that? Fixed pitch because it's one piece of metal all the way across. And you can see the bolts. Those bolts go directly to the flywheel, which is connected directly to the crankshaft. Okay. But the cross section of this propeller, they're all different. Remember that if this thing turns around in a circle, this is a much larger radius or a much greater distance from the hub than this. I'm saying this and this and ugh, that just gets crazy. Let's call it a station. You guys okay with calling it a station? Not a radio station. I get it. Some of these things get confusing. But a station, meaning some distance from the hub, right? Or some distance from a reference point. So this is a station that might be 10 inches from the hub. That's called station 10 or station 20, station 30, station however far I am away from the hub in inches. That's the station. Each one of these stations has a different cross section. And the reason why is because way out here at the tip, this station is moving at a faster velocity, right? Because it's farther away from the hub. If it's moving at 2000 RPM, that is moving faster than this. You guys agree? So a much wider, much thicker airfoil here will allow more consistent flow throughout the entire blade length. All right. And it's also twisted for angle of attack so that at the stations out here, I produce roughly the same amount of thrust as I do here, more of an even thrust distribution. And you can see the twist there. See out here, yeah, I don't have quite as much of an angle, whereas over here I have a big, much bigger angle. Okay. That's your fixed pitch propeller. Constant speed propellers will have the same exact shape, but I can control the overall pitch of these things. Let's take a look at how that works. So this one is a great uh, illustration of that direct drive. Again, there's your flywheel, goes straight to the crank. That's the propeller hub, and then it bolts straight into here, straight into the propeller, okay? A couple other things that I can see here. You guys see the muffler and you see the exhaust pipe. Then the, see these tubes here, this ducting? That ducting takes from the oil cooler and goes over, looks like this one has carburetor heat from the oil cooler, and then this goes to the cabin. So that's where I get the heated air to the cabin. That's the ducting that I'm talking about when I'm saying uh, air ducting. Okay, constant speed prop for a moment. Let's talk about this thing. I set the propeller RPM using the blue knob. Once I set it, it stays there. It won't change as long as I have sufficient power. Well, if I come back to idle, well, of course, yeah, it's gonna come back to 1000 RPM because it's not on the governor. But when it's on the governor, and this is a propeller governor, what that does is that will move this piston and then move these two forks to change the pitch inside the propeller. All right. So here, I don't have one solid propeller all the way across. I got a piece over here, I got a piece over there, and I got a propeller hub. Oil pressure from the engine is used to move that piston back and forth, and then that moves these two forks. This is on a shaft, on an axle or an axis, and it just twists the propeller. So if I have 2,400 RPM set with the propeller control, and I decrease my pitch angle and the airplane starts moving faster and faster and faster, 
then this will have more and more of an angle of attack. The angle of attack will increase to maintain exactly 2,400 RPM. It will never change. It'll stay the same no matter if I pitch up or pitch down. On a fixed pitch propeller, if I decrease my pitch angle and I start increasing speed, I could destroy the engine because it's just going to make the propeller go faster and faster and faster. Okay. Uh, a, a nice diagram of a propeller hub and a lot of explanation. How many times are I gonna, am I going to fly that in the training program? You won't. So what I call nice to know information, but not necessarily need to know. Another one is the FADEC. In the beginning with the uh, key terms, do you guys remember what I said when we talked, when I said FADEC? At Pompano, those guys that crashed that diamond? Okay, full authority digital engine control. Usually those are with diesel powered engines. This requires a computer and requires electronics to keep the airplane engine running. So if you lose that computer or you lose the electricity that runs that computer, the engine will also stop running. Okay. They're typically very, very efficient. They use a little amount of fuel, but they're not very popular because there's a little bit of problem with it, potentially. Whereas our airplanes are the ones that we use in the majority of all flight training, it doesn't matter, you take the battery and throw it out of the airplane. You can take the alternator and just fling it off the airplane. It will still run, right? This can one we, won't. Can we switch to manual mode if something nope. fell over? Nope. You get nothing. Nope. Okay. Electrical system. Anybody seen one of these? You got one of these in every, every AFM. Every single AFM. Here's what I do to, to recommend to pilots when they start looking at one of these. Start at the battery. Wherever the battery is. Oh, look, there it is. And then start from there and just continue forward. So I start from the battery. I got a ground down here. Positive side of the terminal that goes to the battery contactor. This connects directly towards the, to the master switch. And this allows the clock or digital clock to stay running the entire time even with the master switch turned off, okay? Going up to the ammeter, and like I said, primary bus and over here to the, the uh, uh, battery. Battery side all the way down, turns this on. Battery contactor, okay? Coming up from this, we're gonna go to the alternator, and alternator switch, this is what allows the battery to recharge and it comes off into both of the primary and the avionics bus. So whatever type of uh, avionics equipment that I have, an autopilot, uh, flap controls, stall warning horns, lights, anything in the world will come off on one of these either primary bus or an avionics bus. Some digital uh, buses like... Uh... Well, they're just electrical buses, yep. That's all you got. Each one of them will have its own circuit breaker. There's the alternator. The battery is typically over here on the opposite side of that engine. But the alternator you can see is connected to the crankshaft with a belt. Okay. Alternator test. Oh boy. This is your ammeter. You either get an ammeter or a load meter. Uh, the ammeter is going to be at or near zero, probably just a little bit on the positive side. And then a load meter will show me percentage load, whatever that percentage is, zero to 60% of load. Okay. I want to test this before I go on an instrument flight because it's important that I know, or before I go on a night flight, it's important that I know I have sufficient charging to keep the battery working. During a day flight, I could really care less. 
If the battery shuts off or it goes dead, who cares? I'm going to get light gun signals from the tower anyways. I'm going to a controlled field, and I can land there. Or I can land in a non-towered field, okay? either way. The airplane's still going to fly. Night flight or instrument flight, I need electricity. So I have to check this thing. The way that we check it is by putting a load on the system, lowering the flaps, for instance. And you can see the ammeter come down, and then the alternator brings the power back to the battery. Okay? You're just looking for slight movement in that. What pilots do, unfortunately, sometimes is they turn the alternator off. I don't know where this bad habit started from. It's been about 20 or 30 years. It's been a long time. They'll turn the alternator all the way off, and then they'll turn it back on. That's not a good ammeter check. And you can see here, here's your alternator check. Prior to flight, where verification of pr proper alternator and alternator control unit operation is essential, such as night or instrument flights, positive verification can be made by loading the electrical system momentarily. If you extend the flaps that causes those two big motors, those electric motors, to start working, you will load the system. With the landing light or by operating the wing flaps during the engine run-up, <coughs> the ammeter will remain within a needle width of its initial reading if the alternator and alternator unit are operating properly. So I'm only going to see a slight deviation. That's all I want. If I lower the flaps, if I extend the flaps and I see the thing discharging a lot, well, then I know that I don't have a good alternator. Okay. There's your master switch. Left side is alternator, right side is battery. You can turn off the alternator and leave the battery on. Uh, you can turn on the battery and leave the alternator off. You can't do it in the opposite direction. I can't have the battery off and the alternator on. But if you push on this side of the master switch, it'll, turn, it'll shut off both of them. Okay? I can't turn the alternator on and leave the battery off. I can't do that. Prior to each flight, I'll check my circuit breakers to make sure that they're all functioning properly, or make sure that they're all closed. And here, you just run your finger straight across and make sure I don't feel any, any of those sticking out. Okay, let me check and see that all of your circuit breakers are in. And I might fly an airplane with a digital panel, with glass panel, if I do, a lot of times you may have a standby battery. With all of that electrical equipment inside the airplane, if I lose that alternator and I lose my primary battery, it could be very difficult to control the airplane because I've lost both displays that are in front of me. And I have very, very limited backup displays. So they'll have a uh, standby battery in that case. 